All right, everybody, welcome back to another edition of the Lasting Learning Podcast. I am so glad you're here. This week, you chose an awesome week to download, subscribe, or just listen, because our guest today is an all-star. She is truly a jack of all trades. She does absolutely everything, and she does it so well. In just a second, you're going to be able to hear some of what Katie Novak does. Um, but you know, I'd be shocked if any of you out there don't even don't already know what Katie does because she is everywhere. She's got a, a full time job, as we know, um, but she's also out there saving the world of education everywhere. She's got books galore. She consults with people, and she does podcast. So Katie, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's cool to get to come and, and to, uh, you know, talk about some of my favorite things, which are kids and education. So, you know, let's do this. Absolutely. So, so Katie, there might be one or two people in the world that don't know you, mm -hmm. don't know what you're, what you're all about. So can you just yeah. tell us who is Katie Novak? Okay, fabulous. So I am um, a teacher in my heart always. So I started out being a teacher in a classroom of students. I taught um, for 12 years. I taught high school and middle school English. And then I changed my classroom to a more of a district level focus on um, ELA curriculum. And for the past six years, I've been the assistant superintendent of schools in a, a district in uh, Massachusetts outside of Boston. Uh, we're called Grot and Dunstable. And so now I have this really amazing classroom of, of colleagues. And, you know, I always try to think of everything I do as design work. How do we design learning experiences um, with, with all learners to you know, really truly value their identity and value them as individuals? And so that's what I do for my real job. Um, and then also I have this really cool opportunity to do consulting as well. And so um, I consult on something called universal design, which is just essentially um, if there is a learning experience designed and not everybody learns, that is not the fault of the learner. You know, we, we talk about John Dewey in an essay on teaching in like 1910. He said, to say that you taught when not everybody learned is to say that you sold something when no one bought it. Right. And so this concept of like, I taught it, but no one learned it is like, no, no, like it's, it's, it, it's transactional. Like you have to actually design something so that all learners can learn. And so in UDL, we talk about that, like when learners don't learn, there's often a lot of barriers present. And our job is to just try to figure out what those barriers are and how to identify and eliminate them. And so when we're thinking about universal design, it's not just like what teachers are doing with lesson design in their classroom, but what barriers socially, emotionally, um, and behaviorally do we have to eliminate? You know, we have to be more focused on trauma-informed teaching. How do we create systemic barriers or how do we eliminate the systemic barriers that the system has created where we have these marginalized groups of students and these underserved kids um, and it's, it's no fault of their their own, um, their, their will or their ability. You know, we all have this really unique mix of strengths and weaknesses. It's the system wasn't designed for all kids and we need to fight so that it is. Right. That's so good. So I'm, I'm going to take that and I'm going to spin it a little bit. So you said your current job, you're an assistant superintendent. So you mm -hmm. and I have the same role, assistant superintendent, curriculum instruction. Yep. Your job is to help lead adults and inform their practice so they can go change the lives of kids. Right. Yep. So UDL, a uh, powerful powerful concept. It's something that truly, I mean, we all, we all hear it. We hear the terms differentiation and assessment. It's all encompassed within UDL. Yeah. How do you apply the UDL philosophy mindset into your day job when you're working with adults? So one of the really exciting things is um, this year we're really doing this really cool thing, um, which is personalized PD. So we talk about personalized learning plan with kids all the time. Um, there's a lot of states moving to, you know, having kids create this competency-based personalized plans. And um, one of the things that we've been doing is working with a number of different teachers to create a PD committee. And they came up with this concept of a personalized PD plan. So our school calendar, you know, we have half days for PD yeah, yeah. and um, we took four of those and said like we're gonna take we're gonna take the first session and we're gonna talk about what is a personalized learning plan how do you design one how is it built on you know solid self-assessment and self-reflection and built within collaboration and feedback and then all of our teachers actually created their own personalized learning professional development plan where we know we're using district time and we're talking about firm goals flexible means uh, another thing we're doing all the time is you know whenever we provide professional development design faculty meetings um, we want them to look like we want classrooms to look, which is, you know, 
uh, how do we start off by talking about what the goals are and then how can we be more flexible about the methods that we're going to use to achieve those goals. And so thinking about the concept of more, you know, having different stations, having different options, a lot of different times for teachers to use scaffolds and collaborate with one another. Um, just as, you know, it's not a great model to walk into a classroom and see a bunch of kids just like quiet you know, while a teacher is doing all the work, I also don't want to walk into a faculty meeting and see teachers quiet with an administrator doing all the work. So we spend a lot of time just talking about how do we provide options and choices because um, one of the things that I, I find so fascinating is like most administrators, I mean, you and I included, when, you know, students don't learn, we're like, teachers have to own that. But when teachers are not yet effective in meeting the needs of all students, we have to own that. That's on us go. as administrators. <laughs> And that's a really hard thing to do because it's really easy to be like, you know, okay, only 50% of the kids in the state of Massachusetts, for example, where I'm from, only 52% of the kids are proficient, but 98% of teachers and administrators are. And that, that something like, wah, wah, something doesn't compute there because we can't say that we're, we're, you know, strong or exemplary or proficient at, at instructional leadership if half of our kids are, are not learning at grade level. And so there's like so much complexity in the work, but I think it's all about being open, being vulnerable, and realizing that every single person who is in any part related to these systems has the power and the privilege to change it. But that starts with being self-reflective about what we're doing currently that isn't driving that forward. Absolutely. I think that it's a strong point that you're making there, that it, it's truly all about growth. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've made a, st a statement very similar to the one that you just made, and I got pushback saying, well, no, the issue is that the test doesn't measure whether or not students are really learning. Teachers are all out there. They're all highly effective. They're all doing their best. And I'm a firm believer they are all doing their best. Mm -hmm. The vast majority are out there killing it every single day, working really hard. But in, until we get to that point where we own that, maybe the assessment is telling us something and we can actually adjust and shape our practice in a non-punitive way without being labeled failures, then maybe we can actually start making some of those course corrections. So with, with you in your own life, in your own world, how do you measure your own success? How do you determine whether or not you are highly effective? You know, it's, I think it's a moving target. Like I, I try to, to always be really reflective about asking for feedback. I think that's really important is, you know, whenever I'm consulting, you know, at the end of any presentation, it's always, what could I have done differently? That's always a question I ask. Like, you know, I don't need you to sit here and be like, oh my gosh, that was so, I mean, I'd love to hear that. But the reality <laughs> is, is what could I do differently? What could I do better? One of the things that I think we do in this district that's pretty unique is we send out a central office report card where our teachers actually grade our administrators. Um, um, and so it's, it's always, always basically asking, um, where am I meeting the mark, you know, and we put these statements like, you know, Dr. Katie Novak is, is, you know, a strong resource in helping to meet the needs of all students. Do you strongly agree, agree, strongly disagree, disagree? Um, and I mean, people will disagree. That's just the nature of the beast is all of us have things we need to work on. Yeah. And I think that I've gotten really, really good at loving feedback, even though I Nobody likes negative feedback. Like, that's just crazy talk. If anyone tells you, like, oh, I really love a good barb, um, it's just I can recover from it almost instantly because I see that there's value and improvement. And so, you know, I, how do I know I'm effective? Is I know I'm effective at some things, and I know that I'm not effective at some things yet, and I'm always constantly looking for that target. So I think it's really about people's perception is reality. You know, when we ask, you know, was this experience really engaging for you? And people say, no, that is such like a gem to say, okay, so what could I have done differently? Um, and I think that, that that's how I think about parenting. That's how I think about friendship is, you know, if I make dinner and all my kids are like, Wah! I'll be like, don't just say it's gross. What could I have done differently? Like, what is so bad about this? Maybe you could learn to cook, but like, let's work on this together is we have to build relationships. We have to have conversations and we have to be willing to recognize that all of us is weak at something. Yeah. Um, lots of things actually. And that's the beauty of variability is sometimes the kids who are targeted in school as being underperforming, you know, they're, yeah, they, they have weaknesses academically. Um, and luckily, many of us in education, maybe those were not our weaknesses. So we just have to realize that we do have some, and it's a heck of a lot easier to be open to feedback and collaboration and getting better when you acknowledge, like, there's no ceiling over my head that I can always get better at what I'm doing. Oh, that's, that's so good. So much truth in that. And I hope people are going to resonate on a lot of those words. When did you get yourself to the point where you had the confidence to step out of your own district and say, I, I can provide value to others? 
So it was, it was actually a really cool story that my, the first time I ever presented was at the Harvard University UDL Symposium. There we go. So, we'll make it go home. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was a big one. And so um, I was trained in UDL by CASTS, the Center for Applied Special Technology out of Wakefield. They are still the UDL mothership to this day. Yeah, it's an yeah. amazing organization. Um, and I was trained by them as a part of a study called the Tale of Four Districts. I was a seventh grade teacher in a district that got some funding to work with CAST. And so I was kind of like just kind of selected and as a part of that um, they would come out and they would observe us in class and they we would do interviews and things and um, one of the interviews which supposedly got the attention of, of uh, you know a serious mentor to me is Dr. David Rose one of the founders of, of UDL and CAST um, somebody had asked like what um, is your greatest resource in UDL like when we're talking about in the field like what's your greatest resource and I was like honestly it's myself and like I, I literally wasn't trying to be fresh and I can see how that would be, <laughs> be fresh but I'm like everyone's always looking for something outside them to improve teaching and yeah. the reality is the only thing that's going to improve teaching is inside of you which is like the willingness to be open to other ideas the willingness yeah. to like to choose and to do and review I said so I think the reason that I've been able to be really good at this is because like inside of me I'm like willing to engage with it I'm willing to make mistakes I'm willing to try all these things and um, he kind of listened to that and he's like oh that's that's kind of a cool like you know she's not being like the UDL guidelines but like if you're not open to change the UDL guidelines is a freaking piece of paper you know yeah. so like you have to recognize that there's got to be something else I could be doing mm -hmm. and um, so they contacted me and said would you be willing to share your experiences as being a teacher and how it's really important to like be your own expert learner as you're learning about UDL and I was like sure I'll do it so um, I like you know I go like middle school on Harvard I bring in ingredients to make salsa and I'm like I'm gonna hand out a recipe and I'm gonna be like make it and you're gonna be like but we don't we don't have like any vegetables or anything I'm like I don't care take a multiple choice test on how to take <laughs> salsa I brought in salsa I like did a, a lesson on like warts it was like so seventh grade humor and afterwards um, this was gosh I want to say eight, eight years ago now afterwards somebody came up to me and they said oh my gosh that's so cool do you travel to other districts and I'm like I do and, like, <laughs> and he's like okay great here's my card and so I went home and I'm like calling people I'm like what a consultant's charge like I don't know I just went to Harvard <laughs> to do a thing so um, it literally has snowballed from there and people always say like how do you get into consulting I think you have to do a lot of free presentations first is yeah. You know, go to conferences, put in your name, um, you know, say, hey, I'd like to do a session. And if your session resonates with people, they're going to say, well, come to my district. And right. then they tell the district next door. And then they tell the district next door. And, you know, again, it turned into this really cool, um, you know, this really cool opportunity to kind of present all over the world. But I never set out to be a consultant. Um, you know, I set out to share that, like, your best resource as a teacher is really believing that you have the power to transform your own practice and it sucks sometimes um, because you do have to acknowledge that like you have to grieve the loss of some of the things that you're doing that are not great for all kids, especially those kids who are underserved. So your English learners, your economically disadvantaged, your black and brown students, your students with disabilities, um, we have to acknowledge that they deserve much better from us and that means that we have to change even though it's painful to leave some of the things behind that do work well for some other kids. It's just not all kids. No, it's so good. So I'm going to try to recap some of that. First of all, absolutely amazing story. So cool. And I, I, what I really like about that story is that I, I think it exemplifies who you are and what you're about. So you've got, like I said, you've got resources galore. You've, you, you've been, you've written books, you've co-authored books, you've got a new book out right now, George, George Kiros. I mean, you've got resources out there. And when people come to you and say, what's the secret sauce? You could easily say, here's my book, just go read it. You'll get it all figured out. But you yeah. know, that it's the person that makes the difference, that personal connection. Right. You know, at conferences, it's that personal connection that matters. And in the classroom, it's the teacher that matters. Mm -hmm. you know, I think far too often, we're out there searching for the silver bullet and the magic pill to fix things when the answers are already in those classrooms. Yeah. You simply have to release the shackles and say, go teach, do your thing. Let me get out of your way. And let me support you. And mm -hmm. that's a powerful, powerful message. So kudos to you <laughs> for sharing that on yeah. a big stage. So, you know, in, in your, your new book, Innovate Inside the Box. Yep. Um, one of the things I really love about this is that I see 
almost like it's an explicit intent behind the book is to say, yep, we understand that you all think that there are limitations, there are barriers, that you live in this little box and you can't do all this amazing stuff that we always tell you to do, mm -hmm. but you can. And you're trying to tell people to live within the box and to go out there and go big or go home still, right? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I'd like to deconstruct the box as well, but, well, um, yeah, sure. but you know, you can't, we can't so. wait for the bot, the system to change to make a difference in our classrooms is right. really what we were trying to say is, you know, we acknowledge people say the system is broken. I don't think the system is broken. I think it's doing exactly what it was designed to do, Absolutely. You know, which is to elevate and celebrate, you know, privileged populations and yep. um, to kind of create this industrial model of compliance. And, and that's just not what we need from kids anymore, you know, is is like if I need compliance, I have Siri and Alexa and, you know, they now make robots that can pass standardized tests. Like we need kids to think. Right. Um, and these traditional models of education haven't really evolved yet to give kids the, the opportunity to be like, you know, creative problem solvers, to be innovators, to connect with each other. And so when George and I met, you know, I, I was at a conference, I was keynoting after him or before him, and um, I heard him talking about innovators mindset, and in UDL we call that expert learning. Is It's far more important to have a kid graduate being a learner than being really knowledgeable. You know, obviously, if you could have both, that's great. Um, but getting kids to graduate who are knowledgeable is not setting them up for success. It's right. really helping them learn. Like if you have a goal and you recognize there's a lot of different pathways to reach that goal. And if you're resourceful and if you're collaborative and if you're, you know, really goal directed and you're, you know, you're always kind of coming back and you're thinking about like, what is it I'm trying to do? I have to adjust. Um, that, that kid is going to be just fine because we don't, we don't know what we're preparing them for. Um, and it's not even about guessing jobs. It's like, we don't know what, 30 years going to look like. And so if we can teach them to be adaptable and flexible and to find problems and to solve problems, they're going to be in really good shape. And so um, when I heard him, I was like, oh my gosh, like our work has to intersect because yeah. you're talking about most people think of UDL as like a framework for just accessibility for students with disabilities or like engagement. But this is like a beautiful argument that it's also about being future ready or, you know, an innovator. And so, um, you know, what we try to do is to say that, like, the reality is, is that there are some things that a teacher cannot change when the system is not changed. You know, if there is a curriculum that your district has assigned to you and you are required to teach that curriculum, like, that is unfortunately a reality for some teachers, but how you teach that curriculum is is an incredible opportunity to connect with kids to have them reflect to have them self differentiate within that curriculum and so what we are trying to do is to try to say like we're getting kids ready for this crazy beautiful world outside of us and we can do that by providing them with options and choices where those options and choices are appropriate and ultimately we're george and i are both fighting for a system to be less of a box um, and I think that we're getting there, you know, slowly and surely. But the reality is, is there is no excuse to not change what we're doing in front of kids right now in helping them build, you know, um, helping them set their own goals, helping them, you know, solve their own problems. Like that can happen tomorrow despite a curriculum, a schedule, a lack of resources, a lack of time, because that again, is, it's inside of us. It's the beauty of, of connecting with another person and saying, I see something in you that you don't yet see in yourself. And I will not let you fail because if you fail, I fail and we're in this together and having those conversations with, with kids and teachers, that's where we have to move um, in that direction because we're competing with robots. Absolutely. So good. And uh, just talk about the system a little bit. I think it's important for all of us to recognize if we're in education, we're all part of that system. Yes. So yeah, we, we can truly change the system. Sure. Mm -hmm. There's bureaucrats and there's politicians. Got it. Noted. But we are part of the system. Yep. Um, you know, I, I remember I went to a church one time that talked about church being the people in the pews, not the walls around it. It's the same thing in schools. Our, yep. our schools are the people within them, not the walls that surround us. So you want to change the system? Go change. It's awesome. You know, something else you, you mentioned in there, the, the, the word learn. And um, I, I, I'm going to use a statement. I just want you to respond to it a little bit. We're all learning, but it's more important to be learners than learn it. Do you agree, disagree? I mean, yes, because it, like any things that I, okay, the things that I learned, learned in school today, <laughs> example, um, you know, this morning I walked into a, a math class. It was amazing. They were doing professional development on peace, piecemeal function, maybe piece, sure. <laughs> piece something. It, and I was like, they're talking about it in algebra one. Clearly I knew it once. Like I literally knew it once. And I was sitting there in the back of the room, like, gosh. Like, and the whole magic of like, okay, so I knew that once, 
But if I don't know how to learn it again, it means mm-hmm. nothing. It's archaic. Mm-hmm. It's stale. It's shriveled up, right? right? And so I was really interested. So I take out my phone and I'm like Googling like piecemeal function. And then I'm like leaning over. I'm like, what'd you get? What'd you get for an answer? And it's just all teachers in the room. It's professional development. And I'm like, okay, so how did you get it? Can you graph it out for me? Okay. That's what it means to be a learner. Okay. I could have walked in there and gone, this is hard. I don't get it. That is like not an attitude that's going to take me very far in life. Um, And again, the, the thing that I like about those, the innovation skills and being an expert learner is it's like career agnostic. Like, I don't care if your dream is to go and be a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, a plumber or to, you know, camp across the country and find your own way. Or, you know, I have this amazingly brilliant hairstylist who is like one of the greatest artists I've ever known. Um, and like, I don't care what you want to do, but being a learner will help you in any career. Okay. Being really, really learned and really, really knowledgeable. Um, you know, my phone can do that. You might, you might win jeopardy, but (laughs) once you're 15 minutes of fame are done. Yeah. I'll I'll take my life over a jeopardy winner right now. Boom. So talk about your life. What, what, what is next for you or what is your current reality? We know what you, the day job is, but is it, is it just kicked into overdrive right now for you? See, I don't see. I have. I'm a mom of four kids. I have four amazing kids. Um, yeah, I have me. a ten year old. I'm twi- a dad of four kids. So I feel that. Yeah. Yes, I have a ten year old, a tw- twin eight year olds, and a four year old. They're amazing. They're like my whole entire like every joy of my house uh, is revolves around them. Right. So, um, you know, I have this like amazing life raising these four humans. And, you know, when, when I think about what's next is what's really interesting is I feel like I've never chosen my next step. My next steps have always kind of chosen me and I'm really open to whatever comes next. And so, you know, I like to keep my options open. You know, I'm always thinking about where can I make an impact, but also have some balance where I'm home with my family when I want to be. And so, you know, I, you know, I, I, I don't know, like I'm, I'm happy today, I'm happy this year and we'll see what other opportunities come my way. And, and I have no problem grasping at big things and failing completely um, as long as I know that I tried something that my heart was in. And right now my heart is in what I'm doing and we'll see next year what, what the story brings. That's awesome. Can I, can I talk to you real quick about parenting four kids? Yes. Um, I love being a parent of four kids. Yep. Sometimes it is very, very difficult to be the parent of four kids when I do what I do. And uh-huh. I think I know what I know. And some of the other people in their life, maybe at their schools, don't necessarily see things the same way that I do. Do you have those struggles at times, um, whether it's within schools or having those conversations with teachers? So, for example, I don't get to talk at parent teacher conferences because I will. I sometimes push a little bit too hard and ask yep. those questions that make the, the person across the table feel defensive. Do you have those same struggles or do you just go for so it? the amazing thing is i am actually the assistant superintendent in my district where your so kids go awesome okay <laughs> my kids teachers are my colleagues so i have such close relationships with them anyway awesome. um and you know i truly see it as if they feel like they can't be successful then that's up to me to try to figure out how to create a system that better supports all teachers um and so you know i don't i don't maybe if they were in another district but because i have such great relationships with everybody it's kind of like i'm i, I always feel bad though because i'm sure it's like uh who's getting novax kids <laughs> right you know it's like okay I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay out of it um but i'm sure that that's a hard thing and you know three of three of my kiddos are kind of pretty mythical average learners. I have a daughter who is just like an absolute warrior, combined type ADHD and mood disorder. She is the coolest human ever. Um, and she definitely gives uh, us as parents and her teachers a run for their money, but we're, we're all struggling with the same thing. And okay. so when we have those conversations, it's like, listen, if I had the answers, I would give them to myself. So, you know, let's just work together. And this is like an amazing human being that has so many strengths and will be wildly successful. How can we help her to channel that? Um, and I think that that's, the, you know, what we can do for kids is recognize that the kids who are struggling have these amazing strengths and we just have to be much more asset based about the fact that, of course, there are things that kids have to work on. Absolutely. You know, remediation is necessary in a lot of cases. We have to provide targeted intervention, but we can't support plant that you know we have to supplement that and and all kids deserve access and when I say all I literally mean all um and you know some people like so are you saying with kids with really severe disabilities should be included a hundred percent I am um are a hundred percent of kids included all the time no um but my goal would always be to try to get as close to that hundred number as I can because I believe that there's so much more value in inclusion than just again being learned um, the opportunity to learn and grow and empathize and collaborate is so much bigger than anything that we can offer kids from like a textbook or a program. Oh, so good. 
So good. I, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to put you on the spot. Are, are you kind of a big deal in your district? Do people look at it and say, oh no. my gosh, there's no, no, no? <laughs> no, that's what's so beautiful about it. I, I'm always, I'm humbled 80% so, of the time. <laughs> so that's, that's what I want to, uh, I want to point out is you've got this amazing humility about you that <laughs> Uh, is probably not even deserved. I mean, you need to be walking around with a little swag. And oh, no, 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 not here, not you're, here. You're these, saying, <laughs> these people oh. see me lose my shoes and like, has <laughs> anyone see my computer? Yeah, they know me. There's nothing there. <laughs> that is so cool. And it, and it comes across as so genuine. And I, I want to compliment you for that, that you're not this person that has all the answers. You're standing on a stage, preaching at everybody, saying, go fix everything. You, you, are, you live what you are telling all of us to live, which is just live life, embrace your mistakes, embrace who you are, and just keep getting better. And it's, it's so refreshing to hear that from somebody that truly could be walking around with a little swag and expert status, you know, but. Oh yeah, you're, no, you're just, no, none, none of us have, none of us have anything. We're all trying to do the work. <laughs> That's so good, so good. So can I, can I just ask you, I, I tend to wrap up all of my conversations mm -hmm. this way, but um, you can take 30 seconds, you can take 30 minutes. Yep. 30 seconds is the goal though. Um, imagine that 7 billion people, every single person on the planet is tuned in because they heard that the expert Katie Novak is here Oh boy! and she wow. has all the answers to everything, yeah. uh, both about life and love and schools. And they want to hear what you have to say. What's, what is your 30 seconds to 30 minute statement for them? How do we make the world a better place? Uh, I mean, I would say, we're always trying to fix education by talking to people on the outside, people, you know, who are politicians, people who are collecting, you know, data, we're looking at numbers, we're looking at standardized tests, we're looking at curriculum developers. Um, we're not talking to kids that I feel like if we look every kid in the face and we really see them for who they are, we see their identity, we see their, you know, their race and their, you know, their class and their, you know, their choices, gender and sexual identity. If we look at every kid and we say, I believe that you can learn, what can we do for you? I think that we could move the districts in the right places is, is I think that we are elevating and celebrating at times the wrong voices. Um, recently, I had an opportunity to work with a curriculum developer about programs, and I was just looking at it through a UDL lens, and they were saying, well, the teachers, the teachers, teachers said this was really great, and I said, did you ever show it to kids? Um, we're talking about secondary curriculum. Have, are you shopping this all with kids? And they said, no, we don't have, we don't have time to do that. That's not a part of our process. Um, and, you know, I think that, again, if, if we could give kids a little bit more of a voice in the procedures and in the policies and the curriculum adoptions, um, you know, I think that teachers are much, much more open to collaborating with these kids who they know and love as opposed to a lot of the pressure from the outside. Yes. And kids will tell you what I am telling you, which is that there needs to be different options and choices to meet their needs. And we just have to give them the platform to be able to tell us that. Yes, oh my gosh. I feel like I, we should have scripted this ahead of time because that was the, the absolute perfect segue. Uh, you're not even aware of this, but after this podcast airs, the next set of uh, podcasts that go out are the voices of kids. Oh, no way. Conversations with them, just like this, saying, what do you need from school? What's going to oh my be gosh. better? What's, so, well, see, you are, you are just amazing. We're like, I'm a oh, soothsayer. <laughs> that's, that's so good. So good. So thank you so much. My pleasure. For, for being here today. I know how busy and crazy life can get, um, but you taking the time to share all of this wisdom with all of us is it's powerful, and it helps realign our purpose. So thank you so much. Well, have a fabulous day.